Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here uh, on this, this webinar. Um, today, we're going to have Corey Olson uh, provide a presentation. Uh, Corey is with the Wildlife Conservation Society Canada, as well as the Alberta Community Vet Program. Um, and he's been leading the charge basically on uh, PD surveillance in uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan in, uh, over this past summer. And I think uh, it, it's gone well into the fall as well. Um, as you're probably aware, you've seen map updates uh, about PD detections uh, throughout eastern and southern Saskatchewan. So uh, uh, those were, I believe all of them, if not most of them at least, uh, were uh, because of Corey's and his team's work. Um, so uh, he's gonna go into great detail about how he collected these samples and, and, uh, and the results on it. Uh, so excited to hear about uh, PD surveillance uh, from guano collected under bridges and other sites. Um, so uh, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, so just take note of that uh, and uh, we'll take questions at the end of uh, Corey's presentation. So thank you, Corey, for being here and being willing to talk about all the amazing work that you've done um, and take it away. Thank you, Jordi, and thanks everyone for joining me on this uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Corey Olson. I'm a program coordinator for the Alberta Bat Conservation Project uh, with uh, WCS Canada. Uh, we've been operating a program in Alberta over the last uh, six years, and this is the first year of our Bats and Bridges project. Uh, for this webinar, I'm going to begin with a brief uh, project introduction. I'm going to provide some background as it relates to Bats and Bridges. I'm going to provide a brief overview of our methods and some very early results. I do want to emphasize uh, that we're still collecting data from all our collaborators from across Alberta and Saskatchewan. So these results will certainly change, uh, but I thought it would be more uh, useful uh, to provide some of the preliminary results uh, because in some situations I know that uh, others are planning uh, similar projects over the or considering projects over the next year. Before I get too far, I do wanna thank our funders for this project and the many people who contributed to this project. This isn't just me, uh, I am using data uh, and contributions from many people across Alberta and Saskatchewan. And I will ap apologize in advance if I missed anyone from this list. Uh, we are still uh, amassing all of the data from across the project area. We've been operating a citizen science program in Alberta over the last six years. Uh, we are encouraging people to submit observations of roosts uh, so that we can begin to compile a database, uh, a database of roosting observations across Alberta. So we have a partnership with Neighborhood Bat Watch and uh, people can also submit uh, their observations directly to us. But as an important component of this project, uh, we are encouraging participants to submit a sample of guano uh, so that we can submit it for DNA barcoding, which allows us to get an accurate uh, uh, species identification uh, for the bat using that particular roost. We've been doing this over the last six years. We have, uh, I believe, five years of data, and uh, the success rate at uh, identifying those samples to species is very, very high. I don't want to go into this in great detail, but here is a map of our findings from our citizen science program. If anyone is interested, we have a summary poster <laughs> that can be downloaded on our webpage. Uh, but very quick, uh, one of the obvious trends uh, that is apparent from our citizen science program is that for bats reported in buildings, it's dominated by little brown myotis and uh, to a much lesser extent by big brown bats. And uh, there's a scattering of other species, um, but they are not significant. So most of the bats we get reports of using anthropogenic structures are little brown myotis, uh, but those are primarily in buildings and it could be biased by the fact uh, that little brown myotis tends to form large colonies that are easily noticed. But buildings are not the only anthropogenic structure on the landscape. Uh, there are also bridges uh, and those uh, bridges uh, have not received a lot of attention uh, as far as their use by bats uh, goes. Uh, 
Uh, especially in Alberta and Saskatchewan, BC has a program that they are um, conducting uh, this year and I think in previous years. I'm not going to present the results of BC, I'm going to present only the results of the projects uh, that I'm managing in Alberta and Saskatchewan. This is a quick map of bridges across Alberta and Saskatchewan. Uh, this is not uh, all of them, but these are uh, uh, most of the bridges that are in our GI GIS data set. You can see they span uh, from the far north to the far south and the far east to the far west. And this is a very useful uh, property uh, because it allows uh, sampling at bridges to be used potentially to inventory bats over uh, large regions of the country, especially in regions that are un under uh, inventoried uh, for bats. So our project over the last year uh, is focusing um, largely on bridges. We do a number of, of outreach and conservation programs. Uh, but a major emphasis this year was this uh, Bats and Bridges project. And bridges have a number of traits that make them ideal uh, for bat surveys. They are widespread, as I just mentioned. Uh, and importantly, they cross some of the best habitats there are for bats, and that's riparian areas. In grasslands, in grassland regions, a lot of the bat activity, uh, probably the vast majority of it, is uh, highly concentrated uh, near rivers. Uh, so the fact that bridges are crossing rivers is a very useful property. Uh, we also know that bridges are used from night roosts. Uh, there's been plenty of studies in the United States and elsewhere that have shown that bridges are frequently used as night roosts. Uh, bridges are on public land, which makes accessing them very easy. So from a monitoring point of view, uh, bridges are ideal. If bridges are used by bats, there's also important management implications uh, for the timing of construction activities and noise abatement. And concrete has a high thermal mass. Uh, that's what makes it attractive for night roosting. It stays warm at night. It stays relatively cool during the day. Uh, but if you're a bat trying to save energy, uh, having access to a nice warm uh, concrete structure um, might provide some uh, substantial advantage. And for a sampling perspective, bridges might be ideal. Uh, they're sheltered from the rain, uh, they're sheltered from UV radiation, and they have stable temperatures, uh, which should be ideal for, um, uh, for sampling because of the DNA in that guano uh, is less likely to degrade. There have been uh, other studies of bridges uh, from around North America. I'm not going to go over them all, uh, but there are two that I think are useful uh, to highlight. Uh, one is a study by Bat Conservation International uh, that was completed a couple decades. They surveyed bridges across the United States. And one of their, one of their findings was that uh, most of the day roosting activity uh, drops off above 42 degrees north latitude. Uh, that would suggest that we wouldn't have very many bats roosting in bridges in Canada. However, observations uh, by us and others would suggest that that's not true. And certainly our results from this year suggest that indeed bats are day roosting in, bat, uh, in bridges in Canada. And there is also a fairly comprehensive uh, inventory of bridges in Montana, our neighbors to the south. And they reported that about 60% of the structures that they surveyed had evidence of use by bats. And that included uh, little brown myotis and big brown bats, which isn't surprising, uh, but also included hoary bats and western small-footed myotis. And this project, uh, probably just by virtue of it occurring many decades ago, did not use DNA barcoding, uh, which would have been a, a useful tool for expanding the list of species known to use that bridge. Our citizen science program that we've been operating has relied on single species uh, DNA barcoding. Uh, so essentially one or two pellets are used uh, to extract DNA, which can then be identified to species. If multiple uh, uh, bat DNA is included, the test is likely to fail. Uh, this works fine for maternity roosts, uh, which are dominated typically by one species. It will work less well in a uh, mixed roost uh, that has multiple species uh, because it will either fail or it will be highly biased to the most common species, which is typically little brown myotis. Uh, 
So a key part of our project is to use next generation sequencing uh, to extract all of the species, hopefully, uh, that use a bridge site. Uh, this is based on work uh, pioneered by researchers with Northern Arizona University. Uh, using this method, they can extract all the species that comprise a sample of up to about 200 fecal pellets. That's about one tablespoon or 15 milliliters of guano, uh, which at a lot of sites is, is the upper limit of what could be collected unless there is a, a substantial a night roost or a maternity roost. And another, uh, or the guano can also be used to test for PD, the fungus that causes white nose syndrome. And uh, the guano uh, can also be used, and we are using this for other applications, such as examining whether bats are being exposed to pesticides, and in our case, uh, neonicotinoids. And that's a project we're collaborating uh, with the researcher at Environment Canada on. So our project has uh, a few different objectives. Uh, three of the most important uh, include using bridges uh, to inform our understanding of species distributions. Our hope is that uh, we can sample at the periphery of known uh, bat species ranges and to better understand where bats are occurring across the landscape. Some regions of Alberta are well studied. Uh, most regions of Saskatchewan are poorly studied, but even, uh, even a, anywhere across Canada, uh, there's regions that have poor uh, bat survey inventories, uh, which is very limiting uh, when understanding where bats are occurring and how something like uh, white nose syndrome could be affecting their distributions. We'd also like to know how, uh, how important bridges are for bats and how they are being used. Are they primarily night roosts? Are they day roosting? Or are they um, also using them for maternity roosts? And we'd like to know what characteristics of bridges are important for bats. At this point, I think it's useful uh, to highlight that there are some distinctions in how bats might use a structure for roosting. Uh, the simplest way of looking at it is the difference between day roosts and night roosts. Night roosts, as the name suggests, are sites that bats are using during the night uh, to rest. Uh, often what happens is a bat will leave its day roost, it will go out to uh, feed on insects, and then it will find somewhere to rest to digest its meal. And then uh, before the sun comes out, it, they will return to their day roost. But the way that bats use night roosts is often different than how they use day roosts. With night roosts, they're roosting out in the open. If you were to visit a site during the night, you could quite often uh, see the bats roosting out in the open. Uh, they tend to be highly dispersed. Uh, there's a gradual guano accumulation. Uh, and that property could be useful for sampling because you're sampling over a very large time frame, or you're, you're sampling guano that has been deposited over a very large time frame. So these are two bats, this is a night roost. Uh, for many of the bridges that have uh, uh, evidence of substantial night roosting activity, if you were to visit there during the summer uh, after sunset, probably about an hour or two after sunset, uh, this would be a fairly typical scene, which is these bats roosting up in the corners on the underside of the bridge. I'll cover that in a bit more detail. During the day, you won't see those bats because uh, they're hiding in narrow cracks and crevices, uh, but the guano that they deposited during prior nights uh, will still be present. Now day roosting, as you may already know, are sites that bats, our day roost are sites that bats are using during the day when they're not out uh, flying. And day roost could be broken into a number of different subcategories, the most important being the maternity roost. The maternity roost is a location where groups of pregnant or lactating females are gathering for the purposes of raising their pup. But day roosts might also be uh, locations where migratory bats are stopping over during their migration routes. Even, uh, even our resident bats like little brown myotis still undergo migrations of uh, 500 or in, in some cases, uh, several hundred kilometers. In Alberta, over 400 kilometer migrations have been documented. Uh, so you might well imagine that they'll need resting sites uh, during their 
during their migrations and potentially bridges are used for that purpose. Or they could be solitary. Uh, male bats often roost alone or in small groups. And it's also possible uh, that females that might have larger maternity colonies elsewhere could use bridges as satellite roosts as part of a larger roosting network. So these are two day roosting bats. Uh, the one on the right is uh, probably a little brown myotis, and the one on the left uh, is a long eared myotis. And this is uh, a day roost observed in southern Saskatchewan. And I will uh, talk about that one uh, in a little bit more detail later. Day roosting bats often return to the same uh, uh, spot of the bridge uh, night after night or day after day. Uh, so you, you tend to get these accumulations of guano, whereas night roosting is often highly dispersed. Day roosting uh, tends to be a little bit more concentrated because they have fidelity to these specific spots. Uh, so so well-formed piles of guano are often a clue uh, that there are day roosting bats present. And these uh, guano accumulations tend to form directly below narrow cracks and crevices that bats can use for hiding. We found over uh, the last year, several bat maternity roosts. Uh, they're obviously not the most common uh, type of roosting that we encounter, but they do occur regularly uh, across uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan. Uh, th these are two examples in the same type of bridge. These are um, uh, parallel box beam uh, bridges, and I'll discuss that uh, uh, shortly. One of the telltale signs of bat maternity roosts is that you tend to get huge amounts of guano accumulating directly below where they are roosting. Uh, some of these uh, maternity roosts can be in the hundreds of individuals, so they are producing uh, huge amounts of guano. The absence of guano, however, does not mean that there is not a maternity roost uh, because in some, situation, in some situations that guano either decomposes uh, uh, too quick for it to accumulate or possibly insects are carrying it away. Uh, there has been maternity roosts we've encountered where there has not been substantial guano piles. Uh, but in almost every case where there's maternity roost, we do expect uh, that there would be lots of guano uh, stuck to the sides of the bridge, to the sides of the bridge beams, um, because they are also using those sites as night roosts. This is just one example I want to highlight. This is a maternity roost in the southern uh, parts of the grasslands. Uh, this is a panoramic photo of the bridge below it. You can see there are not a lot or any uh, trees around. Uh, this is a, a bridge that bats are using um, in, a, in a region that may not have many other roosting opportunities. You can well imagine that if this bridge was removed, uh, that those uh, bats would likely have to relocate and would not be nearly as common um, in this region of the prairies. So now I want to discuss uh, some of the different types of bridges and how they relate to use by bats. This is an important aspect of sampling because different bridges have a much higher or lower uh, probability of having bats roosting within them. Uh, and the type I want to go over are uh, concrete bridges and there's a few different types of those. I want to discuss uh, steel I-beam bridges and truss bridges and then uh, some of the other types of bridges. Um, that might be encountered. This is a typical bridge in Alberta. Uh, it would also be fairly common in Saskatchewan, although perhaps less so. Uh, this, is a, this is a concrete bridge using precast, uh, pre-stressed uh, concrete girders. Uh, they have a general shape of a T or an I, uh, although there are a number of different configurations, so it's a little bit hard to come up with broad categories. Uh, but what is common and what is important uh, for this class of bridges is that there is these beams uh, with vertical concrete surfaces and there are these deep soffits. And they typically sit on these uh, abutment blocks, uh, which is a spot where we are quite often see uh, guano. Uh, so remember this picture because I'm going to be uh, showing some close-up views and it'll make much more sense if, uh, if, if you have this uh, in your mind. Uh, so the soffits are the place between the beams and the abutment is the, is the structure that the beams are sitting on. 
This is a photo from the top of the abutment. So this is a, a horizontal surface and there is quite a accumulation of guano. Uh, you might suspect that this would be a day roost, but in fact, it's just a really well used night roost. Uh, they don't roost on the abutment, uh, but they roost high up on the underside of the bridge in the corners uh, where there is a rough uh, uh, surface that they can grip. And they, they go there night after night. And it, it appears uh, that bats uh, preferentially select uh, the ends of the bridges, possibly because uh, they're a little bit more enclosed and thus trap uh, greater amounts of heat. Uh, but these abutments are a common place where guano accumulates. This is a photo of up in the soffits on the underside of the bridge. Uh, they use this area for night roosting typically. Uh, they're roosting in the corners uh, where the bridge deck meets the bridge beams. And that is quite often where the guano accumulates. And uh, they often use the bridge ends. In this case, it's, a, it's an end diaphragm, um, the corner of the end diaphragm uh, where that meets the bridge deck. This is a pretty common location where guano can be found. The over a great majority of the guano uh, that we find at these types of bridges are found in, in, uh, in, the, in the soffits uh, near these concrete corners. It is quite dispersed though. And in this case, uh, what we have is a, a concrete girder. Uh, we're looking this time towards the river and they're clearly roosting high up in the soffits near the corners and the guano uh, sticks to uh, the vertical surfaces. And then it also follow, falls down. In this case, we have uh, sort of an I-beam and it accumulates up in the corners, but then some of it falls down and lands on the bottom flange of the I-beam. And there's a close-up. Bat guano is black, rice-sized. If you squeeze it with your fingers, it crumbles easily, uh, whereas rodent uh, feces is hard and clay-like. Uh, the easiest method of uh, not accidentally collecting rodent feces is to collect the bat uh, guano from vertical surfaces where other mammals wouldn't be able to reach. This is just another uh, uh, lower flange of a, a concrete I-beam. So this is a concrete bridge. It's a somewhat interesting design because it's using two different uh, uh, beam types. Uh, to the right is uh, what, we would, what we've been classifying as a parallel box girder design. And on the left uh, is a different kind of design, sort of similar to a, a T-beam, um, but uh, somewhat different. And I'll uh, show that in uh, closer detail in a bit. In this case, we have a bat maternity colony. Some uh, individuals in that colony are roosting uh, between the narrow crevices uh, between the box beams. Some of uh, that colony is roosting in this, uh, this narrow crevice above the pier column. Uh, this is an expansion joint. And they crawl in there and there's, there's a large space. It's very well concealed. And uh, yeah, and a lot of, there, there was, in this case, uh, probably at least 40 bats roosting in there. And then there are also roosting to the left in a somewhat different area. So to the left of this image is, uh, is this image. Uh, in this case, we have uh, that bridge style with the deep soffits. Uh, lots of guano has accumulated on the various diaphragms. And in this case, there's two beams where they come together also forms a narrow channel. And there was some bats roosting in there as well. This is the same bridge, uh, but this time it's where, uh, there, where the box beams uh, come together. Uh, a large portion of this colony was roosting in these narrow crevices between these box beams. And that's a very common roosting site. It accounts for the majority of our uh, maternity roosts is in these uh, box beam style bridges. This is another uh, bridge using these box beams. Again, they have the narrow channels. Uh, these are very reminiscent of how a bat house works where there's narrow channels uh, that bats can crawl up inside and hide. In this case, uh, there was a maternity roost or a suspected maternity roost uh, of uh, big brown bats. 
it seems that most of the maternity roosts we've located are either little brown myotis or big brown bats. In this case, we have a cast in place bridge. Uh, so they're, the bridge components are poured on site rather than uh, um, precast elsewhere and then brought on site. Uh, they, in uh, my experience, they're not used quite as often as the precast concrete beams, uh, but they do still have um, quite frequent use. And the principle is the same. They're finding corners in concrete and uh, uh, using them as night roosts. Now, in the case of steel I-beams, uh, so the other ones were using concrete beams. In this case, they, this bridge uses steel I-beams. Uh, that's, that's not as ideal for bats. Uh, they can sometimes grip uh, uh, rusting metal, but for the most part, uh, they're not roosting directly on metal surfaces. Uh, they, but some of these bridges still have substantial concrete components, uh, so do have some degree of use. A lot of these uh, steel uh, beam bridges are crossing major rivers, and it is often quite difficult to find guano. In this case, the beam is going right up to the deck, so there's not a, uh, uh, an easy to grip concrete surface. But every bridge is a little bit different. Uh, this is another uh, I-beam style bridge. In this case, the beam meets a concrete lip, uh, so there is still a substantial concrete component that bats can grip. Uh, and they will use those sites for night roosting. And for this one bridge, uh, which I surveyed in September, uh, there was also a, a bat day roosting um, out in the open. Uh, possibly it was using that site during migration um, or it might have died and has just uh, been stuck in place. This bridge, also a steel I-beam bridge, uh, but in this case, we have an open access uh, panel at the end, uh, which creates this very cave-like enclosure. And I would this was surveyed by Aaron Lowe, not myself, uh, but apparently there was a large number of bats roosting within this enclosure. Uh, we, uh, or she didn't enter the structure, uh, which would have been necessary to uh, closely examine what was going on. Uh, but it was evident that it was being used by a large number of bats. And this is that site uh, where the long-eared myotis and the little brown myotis um, were observed day roosting. And from a management perspective, this could also be important. Uh, you could imagine what would happen if a construction or bridge uh, inspector or construction crew came along and covered up that panel. Uh, that those bats would be trapped inside and uh, would very likely uh, end up dying. The uh, a common bridge uh, observed in a lot of areas is this truss style bridge. These tend to be older bridges. Some of them are over 100 years old. Uh, they have these trusses. Uh, they're easily recognized because the trusses extend above the bridge deck. They form these triangles, which gives them their support. Uh, but most of the structure uh, consists of wood and metal. And the metal is hard for bats to grip, and it doesn't have the thermal mass that concrete does. Uh, but the greatest problem with these style of bridges is that most of the wood is treated with creosote, and it does not appear that bats really appreciate uh, wood when it's treated with creosote. Having said that, uh, there are no rules in biology and uh, we have observed bats roosting in these bridges in some situations. So this is one bridge uh, where the bat was evidently roosting between the deck boards or between the, uh, uh, the, the planks that run crosswise across the deck boards. Uh, and these, uh, these channels provide the narrow cracks and crevices that bats might use for roosting. It's not a huge amount of guano, uh, but it was regularly used. In this case, it's also a truss style bridge, uh, but it is a hybrid style. So the middle sections of the bridge use this truss design, uh, but the ends of the bridge uh, use uh, box beams. So this is the same bridge um, at the ends and it has these box beams and a fairly large uh, maternity roost uh, was found um, by Lisa Card. Uh, roosting between uh, these narrow crevices of, of the box beams. 
There are a number of different designs and some of them defy categorization. Uh, some of the bridges in uh, 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 Saskatoon uh, had some of the, or were some of the largest bridges we encountered. And at some point a bridge becomes so large that it can't effectively be surveyed that the chances of finding bats, even if they were present, becomes next to impossible. And this would be one such design. Uh, there are a few designs around Alberta and Saskatchewan that are similar, uh, or that have a very low probability of being effectively searched. In this case, we did find big brown bats roosting, um, or we found evidence of big brown bats roosting in the bridge, um, but uh, uh, most of the bridge couldn't be effectively surveyed. So this is a shot to looking up from under the bridge. You can see uh, there's so many cracks and crevices that probably half the bats in Saskatchewan could fit in this uh, single bridge. This is another bridge. This is in Southern Alberta crossing a reservoir. Uh, it's so it's about 500 meters long and we can really only effectively search uh, 10 or 20 meters on either end. Uh, this bridge was interesting though because uh, cliff swallows were nesting uh, pretty much along the entire length of this 500 meter bridge. Uh, so uh, it's difficult to estimate, but there was easily thousands, if not uh, in the tens of thousands of individuals uh, nesting on that one bridge. Another structure that bats could be using for roosting are culverts. Uh, we did not emphasize uh, culverts as part of our study, mainly because the majority of them have metal inserts, which seemed unlikely to support uh, very many bats. Uh, but there are a handful of concrete bridges around, uh, which might also support bats, although our study did not uh, focus on that particular uh, type of uh, crossing. So now I'll uh, talk briefly about the methods we used. Uh, this was a collaborative project. There was dozens of people uh, from across, well, about a dozen people across Alberta and Saskatchewan contributing to this project. So we needed a way of, of coordinating these bridge surveys. Uh, so we used uh, Google My Maps. Uh, it allows, uh, a real time updating of our database to determine where, which bridges have been surveyed and which bridges are still outstanding. Uh, so this is just a shot of, of, uh, of that mapping software. Uh, we we uh, obtained uh, GIS databases of the bridges uh, from the Alberta and Saskatchewan government, and that provided all sorts of useful information on that bridge, uh, which could be useful later on uh, for understanding bridge associations. The GIS data we got from Alberta is much more comprehensive than in Saskatchewan, but in both cases, we got some basic information on bridge uh, design. Our focus of the project was on uh, bridges uh, crossing rivers and creeks. Uh, we, didn't, uh, we didn't do other types of uh, highway crossings, uh, mainly because there's so many bridges that cross rivers that it didn't seem uh, the best use of time to focus on non um, riparian structures. And these are mostly road bridges. So there's lots of uh, train bridges as well. Uh, we didn't focus on those because access is more difficult and many of those bridges have a uh, steel design, which uh, may not be as suitable. And our project included both Alberta and Saskatchewan and our objective was to try to sample bridges from as wide an area as possible. We were envision envisioning this project to be a two-year project uh, to give us time to, uh, to fill in some holes that uh, were obvious, that will be obvious after our uh, first year of collection. One of the useful aspects of the Alberta GIS database is that it includes a, a code for the bridge type and there are dozens of different types of bridges and one of the useful aspects of that is that when we find bridges that are used as maternity roosts, that we can then filter those out and prioritize those for additional surveys uh, for potential maternity roosts. We have a standard data sheet that we were using for inventorying or for surveying these bridges. It includes a description of the construction materials. Uh, it includes a measure of the height of the bridge above the water. For that, we used a laser measurer. 
And uh, we included a description of where guano was found across that uh, bridge site and how much uh, guano was found. We also record, recorded use by swallows. Uh, as another aerial insectivore, it seemed likely that swallow use would be correlated with bat use. All of the bridges are used by one of two uh, swallow species. It's they're either cliff swallows, which have these very identifiable nests uh, that look a little bit like ovens. And uh, the other one would be barn swallow, uh, which has these open cup designs. The primary objective of our study was to collect guano uh, for subsequent testing. And for that, an important tool uh, that uh, we developed was this bat uh, pooper scooper. Uh, in this case, it consisted of a telescopic pole, keeping in mind that some of these bridges uh, are upwards of uh, eight meters tall. Uh, so a long telescopic pole is very helpful. Uh, this is connected to a paint roller handle that has been modified uh, to hold uh, this collection bucket. Uh, there is an inner bucket and an outer bucket so that the inner bucket can be, dis um, can be uh, um, sanitized between uses. So we have about 10 of these, so uh, we don't have to reuse them the same day. They can be brought back and uh, washed thoroughly and bleached. Uh, the remainder of this uh, collection device can be uh, uh, sprayed with bleach between use. And uh, that way, because we have the, the dry outer bucket, we're not immersing new guano in, uh, in residual bleach. Most of the guano that we collected was collected first in these paper envelopes. We've been using paper envelopes uh, um, Oh, since we began our citizen science program and uh, the project in BC has been going on even longer and they also use paper envelopes. The benefit of paper is that it keeps guano in a dry condition and dry guano, uh, the DNA in dry guano uh, lasts for many months and probably years. Uh, whereas guano uh, stored in plastic vials uh, tends to be exposed to persistent moisture, which causes rapid uh, degradation and loss of viable uh, DNA for bar for barcoding. Uh, for the purpose of uh, of uh, inventorying for different species, our goal was to collect. Uh, the greatest diversity of guano from as many locations and including as many uh, size classes of, of guano pellets and as many different shades of, uh, of guano pellets. Uh, the goal here is to maximize the number of species in our samples. Uh, so it made sense to maximize uh, the diversity of guano being collected. Guano used for metabarcoding was preserved in RNA later um, and then frozen. Uh, other guano was just, collect, uh, was just kept in the paper envelopes and then frozen. Um, but for the samples uh, that we intend to submit for uh, the, uh, the DNA metabarcoding, so using those pooled samples, it was preserved in RNA later. Our other objective was to submit a sample for PD testing. Uh, for this, uh, uh, based on work in the US, uh, we concluded that a homogenized uh, guano sample would likely be more, uh, would, would likely be most successful. And uh, the, the issue in Canada is that uh, nobody really wants to uh, uh, blend guano samples. So a simplified approach uh, that we used was to collect about 25 milliliters of guano in a 50 milliliter uh, uh, centrifuge conical or a 15 milliliter conical in the case where not much guano was collected. And then that guano was homogenized with the aid of steel balls. And I've been told th uh, that the uh, Animal Health Lab at the University of Guelph uh, can homogenize this themselves as long as a durable uh, conical is used. In most cases, collecting 25 milliliters of guano at bridges uh, was difficult. Uh, so a lot of these samples don't contain 25 or more milliliters of guano. In many cases, it's more like five, uh, five 10, 15 milliliter uh, samples. So we collect what we can get, uh, but larger samples are more likely, I suspect, to result in uh, a detection of PD. 
Uh, so essentially in the case in the vial on the right, there was a guano sample, uh, some steel balls were added, and then it was shaken until the guano is thoroughly homogenized. So you're probably here looking for answers as, uh, as, as was spoken on the bridge. Uh, so I want to present some early results with the caveat that these will certainly change as we uh, continue to compile the data collected over the next year. This is a map of the bridges that we sampled uh, during this year. Uh, we do anticipate additional samples to come in, especially from the northwestern portion of Alberta and uh, from the south central portions of Saskatchewan. Uh, so those aren't shown here. Our sampling next year will try to prioritize regions of this map uh, that don't have high degrees of representation. Uh, one of the constraints, though, is that not all the bridges have uh, guano. We've submitted uh, over 60 uh, samples this year uh, for PD testing uh, across Alberta and Saskatchewan. And I think some uh, fairly uh, evident trends are starting to, be, are starting to become apparent. Uh, we've uh, detected PD at, uh, what did I say, seven locations uh, in Saskatchewan. All of our samples in Alberta came back negative. Uh, keeping in mind that a negative PD detection does not mean that PD is absent, it just meant that we did not detect it. Um, but given the number of uh, negative detections that are um, starting to uh, compile, it seems unlikely that the fungus is well established in Alberta. Although uh, based on our detections in Saskatchewan, the far south east of Alberta could very well have this, uh, this fungus. These samples were all analyzed at the University of Guelph Animal Health Lab. Uh, we have other samples that are not included here that are still outstanding, so this picture could change this year. And some of these locations are buildings rather than bridges. All five of the locations uh, to the east of Saskatchewan are from bridges, and then the two buildings um, to the west of, to the southwest of Saskatchewan, uh, those are building roosts. In the case of the detections in the southwest of Saskatchewan, uh, we, uh, we detected PD at two building roosts. Uh, there was also two bridges sampled in the same region that came back negative. Uh, however, in the case of the building roosts, they were large maternity roosts, so a large a, a sample of guano could be collected, uh, whereas the sample at the bridge was quite a bit smaller and uh, might have consisted of substantial amounts of uh, big brown bat guano, which is less likely to have PD. Of the five bridges, uh, two of them appeared to be maternity roosts and three of them appeared to be night roosts, although one of those was a little bit ambiguous as to whether it was a night roost or whether it was also a maternity roost. All of our uh, positive detections occurred from August 1st to uh, October 7th, except for one uh, on June 28th. This was submitted by a biologist uh, uh, living near Valmarie. Uh, there was a positive detection at a building in on June 28th, but there was also a positive detection at the same building um, in mid-August. We didn't sample in spring, mainly because our project wasn't up and, and going at that time, although that may be prioritized uh, for next year. The detections of PD in Saskatchewan are are not surprising, uh, given that white nose syndrome or PD has already been detected. Uh, in bordering regions of Manitoba and Montana. Uh, but it is encouraging that regions that would very likely have had PD did in fact have uh, detections, suggesting that the use of bridges is uh, a useful tool for identifying sampling sites uh, for PD. We do not have the results of our species barcoding at this time. Those will be submitted over the next month, and then the results will likely be ready sometime around the spring. Uh, but we have observed uh, numerous bats, and so we know that the bridges are being used by little brown myotis and big brown bats and long-eared myotis. Uh, we also have a DNA detection uh, from one of our bridges uh, surveyed uh, technically in BC, but near the Alberta border. 
of, so we, there was a detection of long-legged myotis. Uh, we anticipate that once our DNA barcoding results come in, that this list will be expanded. So I haven't compiled, or we haven't compiled all of the data collected this year at this time, um, but a lot of it has been uh, entered into our database. And, and so this, these results are preliminary, um, although there's no reason to think that they would change as we get more data. In Alberta, 96 of the 144 bridges we surveyed, so about 67% of the bridges had evidence of bats. Uh, so that's a pretty high success rate of finding uh, uh, bats or bat guano. In Saskatchewan, it's a fair bit lower, 32 of 72 bridges or 44% had evidence of bats. And this difference is uh, even more obvious when you look at bridges with substantial accumulations of guano. Some of these bridges only had a few fecal pellets or uh, a minor scattering of fecal pellets. Uh, not ideal for PD testing, um, but still enough to use a DNA barcoding to determine species. Uh, but bridges with substantial use, only about 15% of those uh, had substantial use in Saskatchewan, uh, whereas about 30% of those had substantial use in Alberta. If we were to just target concrete bridges, the picture is a little bit different. If we were to target the, the uh, bridges with the precast beams, and so the, the types basically with the deep soffits and the open exposed beams, uh, about 89% of those have evidence of use by bats, and that's similar between Alberta and Saskatchewan. If we look at any type of concrete bridge, so any type of bridge that has concrete uh, beams, it would be about 63% of the bridges in Alberta and Saskatchewan, or across Alberta and Saskatchewan, uh, but a greater number of, the, of those bridges in Alberta had use by bats. One of the potential reasons for that is that a lot of the bridges in Saskatchewan appear newer. A lot of them had the uh, adjacent or the parallel box beams, um, but they were fairly new and they were crossing in many cases less substantial waterways, uh, which might explain part of the reason for this difference. We found visible bats, so bats that uh, were day roosting at that bridge at about 27 of uh, the 216 bridges uh, surveyed. Uh, which is about 13% of the bridges. Uh, this is certainly going to be an underestimate because we're only surveying a portion of the bridge and many areas of the bridge are not uh, accessible and thus we could not uh, actually see the bats. Maternity colonies were likely to be present. Uh, not all of these are confirmed, but they were likely to be present at about uh, 14 of the 216 bridges. Uh, this number actually might be quite a bit higher uh, because a lot of the surveys occurred at times of the year when bats wouldn't have been present, or especially maternity roosts, and so they might not have been observed at that time. Uh, bridges with extensive use uh, will prioritize for a next year and try to confirm whether or not they are being used by a maternity colony. So that's all I have to say. I'm happy to take uh, any questions about this project. Thanks very much, Corey. That's uh, an impressive number of bridges uh, that's been surveyed. It's yeah, very awesome, and of course, um, great results coming out of it. I mean, some uh, some sad results. We know that PD is is in a, a portion of these sites, uh, but very important results for sure. So yeah, kudos to you and your team. Um, I'll, I'll first I'll read just a couple of uh, uh, comments that were made in the chat while you were talking, just in case that's of any interest to you. Tanya said that violet green swallows might use cracks, crevices, and bridges in southern Alberta. Uh, and Derek said that I think it's the University of Guelph. They used only five pellets and a bead beater to homogenize the guano. And uh, the bead beater is just really a smaller and automated way to do exactly what you did with the pellets in a larger pile. Um, I saw Vikram's hand up first. So Vikram, go ahead and ask your question. Corey, uh, great talk. Um, just a question, you know, the, uh, the, the DNA data that you're getting, any thought of collaborating with uh, somebody who does uh, 
that kind of stuff with insects to see what their what the diet ranges might be in in various places yeah that's a really good question and if you uh, have any experience with that i'd be happy to discuss after the talk as well um, we are we do have a project that we are starting this year uh, collecting guano from building roosts from maternity colonies and building roosts and we're hoping to have uh, that uh, um, analyzed for diet. Uh, the samples at bridges, uh, there, any, any situation where there's a substantial colony of bridges, there could be some potential to collect guano there for a dietary study. But I think it needs to be uh, restricted in time. So I think there needs to be a collection device placed and then the guano needs to accumulate and then it needs to be collected a few days later. Uh, the biggest problem with uh, collecting random guano is that it is heavily uh, intertwined in spider webs. Uh, so you can imagine a, a study of bat diet is probably going to be highly biased towards spiders in their diet, not because they're eating them, but because they're, they're living with them. So uh, Corey, I, I, I can't think of uh, any, anybody who might uh, have that, do that kind of stuff, but what I'm gonna do is sort of inquire with some of our entomologists to see if uh, somebody knows someone who could help. Uh, it's, it's just that you've got this mass of data uh, and, and um, it'd be great if it could be mined for other things that might be important. Uh, the other thing about the spiders is that um, you can filter out uh, DNA from from spiders, and so um, hopefully that might help. Anyway, I'll I'll look into it. The, the other question I had: uh, How do you get up there to take those pictures? Uh, do you have a ladder, or because um, you've got some terrific pictures, close-ups of the of the of the gaps and things? Mm -hmm. Well, there are there are plenty of. Sometimes you just need a big zoom lens, um, but there are plenty of locations where the bats are roosting at about head height. So. Uh, getting photos isn't always difficult, but uh, definitely having a large zoom is useful. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, now in the case of spiders, uh, bats do eat spiders as well. Uh, so it is an important component of the diet. So uh, some some of the some of the result, some of the spider DNA detections might actually be legitimate and then others might just be because they're they're calling into the guano after the fact. Uh, so that's the biggest problem, but I, I could imagine a lot of scenarios, if you, especially if you're looking for a specific class of insect, uh, that sampling at bridges could be really useful. And we'll have uh, bats return to the same site year after year. So once our database of highly active bat sites is, uh, is completed, uh, those could be really useful sampling sites for subsequent studies as well, even if we don't collect the sample in the present year. There were uh, some related comments to that uh, from Mandy, for, uh, yeah, about uh, insect ID from Mandy that Simon Fraser University is working on insect species ID in bat guano. And Derek uh, said to Vikram that uh, he has a paper on diet analysis from guano. So let him know if you want that. Um, and Beth Claire is probably a better resource for the bat diet stuff. Uh, next question or hand up I saw is from Alyssa. Go ahead. Hi, thank you. That was a fantastic presentation. I really appreciate you sharing that information. That looks like a lot of work. Um, one of my questions was how quickly guano degrades in, in a plastic container. So we have people shipping us guano in the mail. Um, I've been able to identify because we just have two <clears throat> main species here that use buildings, big brown and little brown bats. And I can identify them by looking at their guano. And then I've had that independently tested through three different labs to see how good our ID is from that kind of species ID. It helps us to more quickly identify hundreds of colonies to species here. But again, I'm having people send it in the mail, so I have to put it in a crush proof container. And I'm just wondering <laughs> um, if at some point uh, we were having citizen scientists or, or homeowners collect that stuff from buildings and send it in, if uh, it would degrade quickly, like in the mail, in the little pill bottles we send, um, and we need to find something cardboard. Yeah, so we've we've been getting people mailing us samples for quite a while, and and yes, yeah, some of it gets badly crushed. Uh, one one method that can be used to minimize that is to um, have the guano encased in cotton balls, which provides a little bit of resistance, so it doesn't crush quite as badly. Um, 
in theory, there might be ways of using the plastic vials, perhaps some desiccant beads would, would be helpful in a few situations. Um, but the, the paper envelopes has had a really high success rate. So I would, I would suggest at least considering that depending on what your uh, objectives are. Great, thank you. And I guess my next question was just if you've uh, patented the, the design of your guano scooper, or <laughs> if not, if that's something that um, if our transportation agency folks were interested in, in having a little bit of um, the design shared, if you'd be open to that. Yeah, send me, a, send me an email after the fact and I'll make sure I uh, send you my thoughts or my description of how to do it. It's not, uh, it's not a formal uh, patented product, <laughs> but it's easily constructed from parts at uh, Home Depot. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I think related to that, um, I don't know who the person is behind it, but WCS Canada, so you probably know them, said, uh, I don't risk moisture, so best to send guano in small cardboard box, not plastic bottle. Uh, local genetic labs suggest cotton balls to avoid crushing. Uh, next question I have from the chat uh, is from Derek. Uh, great stuff. Do you think bridge design can be used to come up with artificial roost structures intentionally? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it would be easy to design bridges uh, specifically to attract bats. Uh, anytime that you add uh, rough textured narrow gaps and crevices, uh, you're very likely to attract bats, especially if it's in an area of the bridge that would likely stay warm. I guess the bigger question might be the larger philosophical issue of whether you should be attracting bats that wouldn't otherwise occur there or whether you should uh, kind of keep things the way it is. And I suppose one important component there is, are we, have we already destroyed the natural habitat? And if we don't provide an alternative, there would just be nothing? Or is there already plenty of natural habitat and encouraging uh, a, a a species that will use human structures, perhaps incur, perhaps perhaps those species will displace uh, some of the uh, naturally occurring species. Uh, so I think there's large I think there's a lot of uh, philosophical or large number of philosophical questions that would need to be addressed before going down that route. But uh, it's definitely an option, and I know it's being successfully used in uh, in some regions, especially in the United States, to help protect uh, species like the pallid bat. Um, so there, there is some potential use there, but it's, uh, it's a bigger question, I think. Uh, next hand up I see is Dan. Hi, this is a uh, really cool stuff. And I think it's uh, similar to a lot, of, um, a lot of work that we've done in Montana, south of the border. I work for the Natural Heritage Program down there and we're at about 80 to 90% of our bridges surveyed for roosting bats. Um, one of the things I've been curious about and really haven't had a chance to uh, look at, and curious if you guys are planning on doing that, is um, repeated surveys at, um, you know, both uh, maternity colonies, but also just day roosts. Um, it seems like we've uh, we've documented use at a number of bridges, and then we'll drive by, go in to do some other survey work, um, and stop by and take a look, and the bats won't be there, or they're there sometimes, not other times. So. I guess in the context of these like larger geographic surveys, I've always just been curious if you're going out and doing a, you know, a single visit to a bridge, are we really getting like a, a true a holistic view of how bats are using these structures? So. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And there has been at least one bridge where I went there one day and there's lots of evidence of bats, but I couldn't really see that many. And then the next day I come and I, I can count like over a hundred. So uh, there is some variation from day to day, whether it's just one day they're hiding better than the other, or if they're moving one location one day and then moving back or uh, somewhere else another day. And so I agree, I think there is some uh, benefit from having repeated visits. And I think the way to approach that would be to identify the subset of bridges that have lots of guano accumulation. Because I, I don't think it'll very often be the case that you get a huge colony um, in a bridge that doesn't have guano uh, dispersed across the bridge. Um, but if you identify those high use bridges and then uh, uh, make subsequent visits, I think that would be a good approach. And I, I'd also emphasize that a lot of our surveys are occurring in uh, like September and October or early in the spring. Uh, which are not times of the year where you'd expect to have a maternity colony. So it's kind of the first step. And then the next step would be to follow up with a properly timed survey to see if there's bats present. 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, Corey, you speak conscientious of your time. Uh, we are at the top of the hour. Do you have time to answer more questions or do you want me to wrap it up? Yeah, I have plenty of time. Okay, great, awesome. Um, next hand up I see is Mike. Yeah, hi, Corey. Great presentation and, and, and good work to you and all of your colleagues there for all this hard work. It's awesome to see. And so I'm just kind of curious, um, what would be the like the next steps for, you know, after we've identified maternity roosts and in particular these, uh, I think they were two PD positive maternity roosts in Saskatchewan. I'm just kind of curious if you or your groups have any follow up uh, studies planned for those specific roots, roosts, uh, that specifically, and then more on a general perspective, if there's any plan like in the short to long term period of, of what we're going to do with the data uh, from the maternity roosts that you identify and just kind of curious what, how the project, where, where it goes from here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So we haven't finalized our plans for next year at this point. Uh, so that'll be a discussion we'll have and we'll uh, kind of iron out our plan going forward. I think there is a number of follow-up studies that could be useful. Uh, one would be a simple monitoring of the existing maternity roost to see how stable those are. Uh, it would be interesting, especially in the, uh, especially, well, we would need baseline information on the size of that maternity roost, and then it would be interesting to monitor how that changes once uh, PD becomes established within our region. Uh, we assume that our bats would be uh, negatively affected by PD, uh, by the fungus and whiteness syndrome, um, similar to how Eastern Canada has been affected, but uh, that's not a foregone conclusion. Uh, so it would be, I think, useful to see how our bats are being affected by this disease. Uh, another one would be to better understand the structure or the properties of the bridges that are being used by maternity roosts. So some of the um, um, microclimatic properties of those bridges that they're selecting so we can better understand what uh, traits are attractive to bats. Uh, another potential follow-up study would be to see if uh, white nose syndrome is actually occurring in Saskatchewan. Uh, there's no reason to think it wouldn't be, um, but uh, detection of PD is not the same as a detection of white nose syndrome. Uh, so some of these sites might be useful locations just to confirm uh, that the symptoms of the disease are manifesting in uh, bats across the prairies. Uh, and then, yeah, subsequent monitoring. Um, yeah, and there's, there's a few different projects like that and collecting guano samples uh, for uh, follow-up studies regarding diet and um, other uh, similar objectives. Uh, but uh, a lot of these, uh, a lot of our activities going forward um, are still in the planning stage. Excellent, thank you. Welcome. Yeah, and I, I was hoping too that, um, as you were saying, that this year was a little bit too late to do spring surveillance. Uh, but if next year spring surveillance is on the agenda, um, whether that might offer some opportunity to find some potential carcasses from bats that did make it to the maternity roost, um, but then died maybe of white nose syndrome. Um, have you found any carcasses uh, at any of these bridges? I know in, in the summer anyway, it's slim chance that we'll diagnose white nose syndrome, but even for just bat health surveillance, were there any carcasses found? Yeah, I don't recall seeing any carcasses, uh, but as you say, they'd probably be scavenged fairly quickly. So that's not perhaps surprising. Um, it, definitely in the spring, it would be the better time to go and look. And what I, what I think would be a, a good option and I'd like to do is to target some of the bridges where there has been lots of activity and uh, focus the spring collections at those sites. Uh, so collecting additional guano samples and having that tested at a time of year where uh, detecting PD might be a little bit higher, I think would also be useful. Um, and that would also give us the opportunity to identify any carcasses that have been uh, recovered there. Our, um, um, sorry, I'm just putting my questions in here as well. Um, were there any indications, especially with how mysterious bats are um, in Saskatchewan, that we know so little about hibernation sites? Are there any structures that, you, that you've seen that you think, well, maybe bats could use these structures for hibernation sites? For example, the one where there was an actual hole in the concrete. Are these cavities big enough, deep enough, and might they hold temperatures suitable for hibernation? Mm 
My guess is that across the prairies, they're probably not staying warm enough for hibernation, uh, possibly in some parts of the country, British Columbia especially, maybe they are warm enough for hibernation. Um, but uh, I don't know, in many of these cases, we're just kind of assuming we don't really know how cold they're getting during the winter. So uh, a good step might be to uh, leave uh, some temperature sensors out uh, just to see what kind of temperatures they're, they're reaching. But I would be surprised if they were staying above uh, freezing in most of these cases. But yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, I think the next hand up was from Joanna. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks very much for the presentation, Corey. Super interesting. Um, I guess this is related to comments you were just making. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on the seasonality of detect, uh, collecting guano for PD detection? Um, I mean, I've, I've, my understanding is spring is ideal, but um, it was interesting that you were still getting PD detections in the late summer and fall. Um, and yeah, so I was just wondering if you could speak to that a bit. And I was also wondering if you uh, had to make any efforts to collect fresh guano or if just any guano will do. Yeah, so there was a there was a webinar a while ago from uh, some researchers with the, uh, I think USGS or US Fish and Wildlife Service, I can't remember their names, um, where they were discussing uh, their approach to uh, sampling uh, PD from guano. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe there was two kind of peaks of detectability and one was the early spring and one was the fall. Um, uh, possibly in the fall, they're making return trips from their hibernation sites. Uh, so, but my understanding is that the collection in the spring is kind of the ideal time because they're bringing spores um, from their hyper, hibernacula and the detectability would be a little bit higher at that point. I don't have any data myself as to how long uh, the DNA remains viable in the guano for the purposes of PD detection. My guess is that it's probably quite a while. Uh, so if you're collecting guano, from over a large time period, which if you're collecting guano deposited by night roosting bats, it's probably a scattering of guano all the way from the spring to whenever you collected it. Uh, I would think there would still be a, a decent chance of detecting PD. Uh, as to whether our positive detections in the fall uh, were from guano deposited in the fall or guano deposited all the way back in the spring, I, I don't really know. Um, but it could be, really be either, I suspect. A lot of this guano is really dry, so it should preserve DNA fairly, fairly well. I didn't uh, make much of an effort to collect fresh guano. I did try to avoid guano that looked really old, um, but it's really hard to age guano <laughs> other, than, uh, other than avoiding the stuff that's kind of gray and um, looks old. Uh, so a lot of the guano we did collect was probably over a large time frame. Thanks. And uh, Derek added in the chat uh, related to that, that in Ontario, he has data that's similar detected on bats in May and then absent from the same colony of bats in early July and are present again in the same colony in late August. So definitely interesting uh, how those detections work. Um, I have a question from Diana in the chat. Uh, it sounds like it's kind of a question to, to everyone. Uh, we'll see how that goes. So any thoughts about the usefulness of identifying strains of PD at northern latitudes? Um, and then the second part of the question, identifying distinct, distinct strains to infer on a very coarse scale about bat movements. For example, if PD strain in Manitoba is distinct from uh, Montana, does it infer some isolation? Um, although understand homogeneity due to clonal reproduction elsewhere in North America. Do you want to tackle that question, Corey? <laughs> And um, no, there's probably uh, someone on the call that have more experience in this regard than I do. I'm not really uh, an expert in uh, genetic analysis of PD. Yeah, I don't know myself either. I, I'd say there's probably some opportunity there um, with with clonal strains. I don't know, but I know that that they've looked into the the early Washington detection, and I think it was through viruses associated with uh, PD that they were able to figure out where that came from. So I'd say there's some opportunity there. Um, 
but yeah the, the question is about i guess the usefulness of of that uh, of, of looking at movement patterns of bats based on on pd uh, interesting topic for sure um, I guess we'll we'll move on. We, if that's a discussion that people are interested in, we can take that offline. We'll move on with some other questions uh, for Corey. Um, Jeff asks in the chat, uh, interested to know if you can detect individuals, um, for example, to do a population count from guano like they do with caribou. Yeah, we're not we're not doing that, and I'm not aware of an option to do that. Uh, although I wouldn't be surprised if a genetics lab would be capable of developing such a test. Um, I haven't I haven't explored that option myself, though. So there might be there might be some on the call that uh, would know that answer, but uh, uh, it's not an option I'm a, I'm aware of. Um, and JP is asking. Are you are you able to culture PD from the qPCR positive guano? I uh, I don't know the answer to that specific question. Although I think it might be an interesting question for some applications because the detection of of PD uh, through DNA does not necessarily I would. I would assume would not necessarily mean that the PD is still viable and capable of causing disease at that point. Yeah. Uh, Corey Lawson uh, responded to Diana's question. Uh, she believes that the partidi virus would be a good way to look at the strain of the P of PD to piece together spread patterns in terms of geography, uh, like Tapas and, and Rose Rosinick's work. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, I don't see any new hands up, uh, but Dan and Mike, you still have your hands up. Is that uh, new questions or is that still the old ones? Okay, those hands were just lowered. Uh, any other questions before we wrap up? Okay, hearing nothing. Uh, thank you very much, Corey. That was a great presentation. Again, very impressive, uh, the amount of sites that you've identified and visited uh, and uh, the, the guano that you've collected there, very important results. Um, hopefully it'll go well uh, next year. Uh, and um, yeah, hopefully some more answers about PD detection. Does it mean that white nose syndrome is there as well? Uh, are we going to be able to detect that there? Uh, so we'll, we'll definitely keep in touch about that. Uh, so thank you very much again, and thanks everyone for tuning in and for asking great questions. Uh, this was a great webinar. As mentioned, it is recorded. Um, if all goes well, uh, I will post a recording uh, very soon for your reference as well as for those who have missed it. So thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for coming. <laughs>